We like to drink beer. A lot of it. After a long night of drinking and talking crime and conspiracies, there's nothing that wakes us up and gets us ready to start the day better than Just Brew Coffee. With a great selection of roast levels to choose from, you're guaranteed to find one that suits your style. Small batch roasted to highlight the unique features of each coffee bean, Just Brew Coffee caters to both casual and hardcore coffee drinkers alike. Since 2010, Just Brew Coffee has worked tirelessly to perfect the roasting process and technique, which has resulted in seriously delicious, always flavorful, and never bitter tasting coffee. If you're already drinking JBC, raise your mug. If you're not, raise your standards. Check out their online store at youjustbrew.com and up your coffee game today. Use code NECRO15 to receive 15% off your order of two pounds or more. And remember, they roast, you just brew. In part three of our discussion on JonBenet Ramsey, we continue to look at the investigation of her murder. We'll talk about the politics that hindered the investigation, why it took so long for John and Patsy Ramsey to give interviews to the police, Burke's odd interview with a child psychologist, and an open letter from Fleet White that calls out everyone's bullshit. I'm Mike. I'm Ian. And I'm Dave. If you were suspicious of Fleet in parts one and two, stick around. He just might be the hero we all need. This is Necronomapod. There is the impression that from day one, the two of you refused to cooperate with the police. No, that, that is a, a media myth. Uh... Your lawyers advised you then not to submit to police questions. Why not, people say? Wouldn't you have wanted to tell them everything? Well, I don't recall that our lawyers told us that at the time. Uh, we were perfectly willing and anxious to work with the police to find the killer. We had a higher priority at that point, and that was to bury our daughter. Why did they accuse you? I think the police looked at the situation, didn't apply a lot of logic to it, and said, child murdered in the home, the book says the parents always did it. And that became the conclusion. The tragedy of the police investigation was that it ended on December 26th. All right, so Ian, I promise I'm not going to ask any more questions. I'm not going to ask who Steve Thomas is. <laughs> I'm not going to ask who? for clarification on anything. Dave, don't do it because you will get fucking your ass tore up by people on YouTube who did not take kindly to me asking Ian uh, last week who Steve Thomas was. They didn't love it. They thought this is knowledge you should have already possessed. Yeah, apparently they thought I had every character of this story memorized. They must not have listened to any other shows before, and they don't understand this uh, the, the dynamic, dynamic here. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Clearly, Mike knows nothing and learns as he goes. Ian is the expert researcher, and Dave chimes in with his uh, comedic quips. And research. And, and occasionally the mm -hmm. research. No comedic so, quips in this one. There's not a lot to be no. funny about. But what? anyways, no, someone uh, on YouTube commented that we should do better research because I had to ask you for clarification on who Steve Thomas was after you mentioned him, I think, one time in that episode. And I just wanted to clarify because my drunken mind is a little hazy sometimes. It's true. Yeah, we've been, we've been, there's been a couple of people getting, getting a little hot over this episode, yeah, but isn't over all, this series. Yeah. Isn't it all over YouTube though? No. The, the all, cesspool of no. trolls living in their mom's basement jerking off to anime. <laughs> Isn't that what it is over there? Well, that's YouTube for sure. But. <laughs> I said it's a cesspool of trolls jerking off, living in their mom's basement, jerking on, off to anime. On YouTube? Yeah, probably. Mm. But Whatever. it's not just YouTube. People are commenting from all over the place. Everyone thinks they know what happened. They already have it solved. There, I mean, This is... It's a heated debate. Out this here. is a heated debate. It's been a... I don't want to say fun because it's not fun. It's a very interesting topic. It's a very... Um, I don't know. A emotional topic it's sad but everyone everyone has their theory and some people are pretty steadfast with it and i think the three of us are not quite that way well and ultimately i don't know if you will be that way at the end of the story some people are very certain when i don't know that you know I'm, the I think facts that they're referencing lead to the conclusion they believe it leads to it's it's if you to, to have a certain theory i'm learning for this means that you're just gonna either not believe or push aside some evidence and just take one straight line to who you think did it. Yeah. And you might just say, well, this evidence is discounted or this evidence means more to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying they're right or wrong, but that's what you have to do in this because you can pin holes in every single theory. 
Uh, I think that's right. Ian, what's the what's the the one person emailed us and said it's a Occam's razor situation where the simplest answer is probably the mm. the correct one? Yeah. I don't know if that's true in this case. But that is what Ian said last week. Uh, to a degree. You said that you, something like you should ignore, not ignore. There's a lot of you can make a lot of all of the quote evidence, but it's probably a lot simpler than that. Like the police investigation, I meant like the police investigation muddies things up. Um, Stuff we're going to get in today really muddies things up. Right. But you can't ignore the pineapple and different things like that. I mean, Which pineapple? The pineapple that was in her stomach, not okay. pineapple pizza. No, I was, I we're ignoring we're that. Gonna, we're not going to get into that again. We People want a fisticuff with us over that one. I'll just say that I think there's probably a lot of innocent people in jail right now because people on juries use that the simplest explanation is the correct one logic. I don't think it's always accurate. I, I I agree. I don't think that's that's always the case. That I'm not saying that is here. I I don't know. I, I'm at a point. I don't know what the logical answer is. I don't. What is the easy answer at this point to say her family just because they're the closest ones? I'm not at a point where I could say that yet. And we'll give our, like we said, we'll give our final thoughts at the end of maybe next week's show when we conclude it all, but. Right. I'll give it a, a teaser for next week that uh, I have an opinion that's going to be super unpopular. Boom. Hmm. Tune in next Can't week. Can't wait. <laughs> so. You mean more unpopular than the fact that you want to punch pineapple pizza eaters in the face? <laughs> I never said that. Well, I, I don't want to physically assault It's anyone. a gross exaggeration <laughs> of uh, the conversation, Mike. Well, I'll punch him then. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna punch me back, probably. I believe someone already threatened to cut you up and put you on a pineapple pizza. <laughs> it's gotten bad, man. <laughs> People take their fucking pineapple pizza seriously. So, all right, well, we've had our fun. We've had some laughs. Let's get into it. Ian, what do we got? Well, we thought we were gonna be wrapped up this week. We thought we'd get through it in three parts, but there's there's it's, there's so much here. There's there's no way. So tonight we're gonna get into the investigation and how the Ramsey's handled the investigation. And then next week on part four, we'll get into the suspects and, and theories on all, on all the different suspects. It's a good format. I like how you put this all together. Thank you, sir. Sure. So after the autopsy was completed on December 27th, 1996, at 3 p.m., the Boulder Police Department secured a second search warrant of the Ramsey's home. Later that evening, John Ramsey went to the Christ Mortuary to make funeral and transportation of arrangements for John Bonet's body. Do we know what that search warrant included? Was yeah. it just a blanket one for the whole house? So we can post links to it. There's documents out there that show mm -hmm. like an inventory of stuff that they were that they took each time. And they were only allowed specific things, right? That's what's alluded to is that they were kind of told what they could take and what they couldn't take on each search. Cause we, yeah, that, that was something we discussed last week with them. And we had a question about this from one of our loyal listeners, uh, Glasshopper, asking about why they didn't test the fur coats. Right. They weren't allowed to. They were, according to Steve Thomas, they were told no. Well, and even in this episode, you know, we'll get into it later, but additional items where they come back later and want additional stuff that just seems logical that would have been covered in this first search. <laughs> right. You yeah. know, before anyone could, you know, alter any You're trying evidence. to apply logic to an illogical well. investigation. At 9.30 p.m., Detective Linda Arndt and Sergeant Larry Mason went to the Fernie home to speak with John Ramsey. And John informed them that there would be a private memorial on December 29th at 2 p.m. And afterwards, they would be flying to Atlanta and John Benet's funeral would be held on the following Tuesday. Linda Arndt left telling John Ramsey she would contact him on December 28th to schedule formal police interviews for both him and Patsy. On December 28th, 1996, before noon, the Ramseys went to the police station to answer some questions and give samples of hair, handwriting, and blood. This included John Ramsey, John Andrew Ramsey, and Burke Ramsey. Police said that Patsy was too distraught at the time to give any evidence samples. And according to Steve Thomas's official police notes from that night, because um, on the 27th, they had police officers there in the house with them, mm -hmm. that Patsy was just uh, really drugged up on Valium and would just w would wake up throughout the night crying and asking if the windows were locked and stuff and then just fall back asleep and stuff. So Understandable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So at this point, they seem pretty cooperative, and they're doing everything that's asked of them, right? Initially, yeah, right. Well, at, some at of that point. weird stuff, though, the day of, you know, the 26th, when he's gone for 90 minutes, and then they're talking about flying to Atlanta. Yeah, but, uh, you know, stop. also they're possibly in shock, and so I don't know how They're not doing anything to impede the investigation. At, at this, this point, point, right. Yeah, you're right. Shortly after giving these samples, without consulting with John or Patsy, John's corporate lawyer, Michael Bynum, told Detective Art that the Ramseys would not give any more testimonial evidence without a criminal attorney present, and they would no longer share privileged information with the police. Um, and since he was no longer a criminal attorney, Michael Bynum called Brian Morgan of Haddon, Morgan and Foreman in Denver, and it was one of Colorado's top firms. And by Saturday evening, the Ramseys had retained Morgan. So Michael Bynum stepped in and said, no, nah, this isn't happening anymore. Well, and we talked about him last week getting tipped off from inside the department that they were, the police viewed them as the main suspects, right? Right. So they shouldn't, of course they shouldn't be allowed to talk to the police without attorneys present. Right, yeah. So. But the way that this is told is that, yeah, he just shut it down. He was like, no, nah, they're not going to cooperate anymore until until they have a lawyer, which Nothing wrong with that. I agree. Well, what does it mean, share privileged information? I would assume privileged information would be anything regarding the case, any type of questions, you know, is how I assume that's how I interpreted that. Mm. Like any real questions. Throughout the afternoon, Pam Pa, Patsy's sister, went to the Ramsey home to collect items for John Benet's funeral, and Patsy picked out clothing for her burial. At some point in the afternoon, lawyers... Brian Morgan and Patrick Burt met with the Ramseys at the Fernie home. While this was going on, DA Chief Trial Deputy Peter Hofstrom contacted the coroner and asked him if there was any reason to hold John Bonet's body for further examination, and Dr. Meyer said no. On December 29, 1996, the Ramseys flew a private jet piloted by John Ramsey to Atlanta, Georgia for John Bonet's funeral. That same day at 9 p.m., the Boulder police secured a third search warrant for the Ramsey home. What happened to the pilot? I don't know. John just decided he was flying. Yeah. He probably said, I'm getting the fuck out of this. I don't want anything to do with this family. I just think that maybe after a tragedy like that, you shouldn't be flying the plane yourself. Yeah, just a couple of days later. Yeah, that's all. Probably had a couple of volume himself, I'd imagine. Probably not thinking straight. Possibly. Flying under the influence. <laughs> gonna get pulled over up there <laughs> <laughs> those stories happen more often than i'm comfortable with you know drunk pilots trying to get on a plane oh and yeah oh really the gate agents spotting them and calling the police yeah like yeah, that's frequently terrifying that's not it great. is i mean i don't know is it frequent uh, it's it more than more often than it never should. <laughs> <laughs> i think a couple times this past year i mean i guess Ooh. most planes essentially autopilot themselves so but still Still, if you get into some sort of trouble, yeah, yeah, it's not great. It's like no. that movie with Denzel when he was a drunk pilot, but he uh, and he like fly the plane upside down because he was such a great pilot and saved everyone. You're asking me about a movie. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't, I don't know. remember that don't one. Know. But he was fucking hammered. <laughs> That's a good movie. I can't remember. There's the name that of movie that. about snakes on a plane. I know that one. <laughs> <laughs> on December 30th, that day has a lot going on. Uh, first, 300 friends and family attend a service for John Bonet at Dobbins Funeral Home in Marietta, Georgia. Afterwards, it's determined which lawyers would, would represent which family member. Brian Morgan represents John. Patrick Burke rep represents Patsy. And Hal Haddon represents Burke. Instructed by this team of lawyers, the Ramsey also hired Patrick Corton as their spokesperson. Police took more blood blood and hair samples from John Ramsey and other family members. And that's something that they get people get suspicious of is the um, the spokesperson thing, immediately hiring the spokesperson. But that's on the advice of their lawyers. I don't think there's much suspicion to that. I mean, if your lawyers are telling you to do something, I don't disagree at all. Follow what the lawyers are saying. The guy's a high-profile public guy. It just, and it's a it high-profile case. Yeah, of course. You would almost, like, I almost feel like that would be, like, just another level of protection that you would want to take. Like, okay, anything publicity-wise, it funnels through this person. 
And that's like a shield and a wall for us so that we can focus on everything else. You see family spokesmen on the news all the time for victims of crime or things that's like that. That's what I'm saying. It's not like, unusual. I, I think that's just a, a, a nice level of protection that you probably want. Yeah. They're not calling you now. They're calling the spokesman because they know that's who they have to go through. Agree. Probably still calling you too, but. Sure. On December 31st, 1996, John Benet's funeral was held at Peachtree Presbyterian Church in Atlanta, Georgia, and then she was buried in Marietta, Georgia. On January 1st, 1997, the Ramseys still have not formally talked to the police, but gave a televised interview to CNN regarding the crime. In the interview, Patsy's visibly upset and appears to still be taking the, vol the volume, but she also warned the Boulder community that a killer is at large. And it's a real dramatic thing where she's like... Uh, you know, keep your children. Sure. And watch. Yeah, I've and, seen it. Yeah. Right. Uh, this did not make the police happy because they haven't been able to talk to the Ramseys formally. And here they are just showing up on CNN, giving a nationally televised interview regarding the case. Is any of this on the advice of counsel? Did they argue for or against this CNN interview? I'm not sure exactly. You never know what's going on behind the scenes there with the attorneys. This is also very quick after her death to be going on national television before you even speak to the police. I, I think it's a little quick like this. This is one that I would critique by them. But we saying, just said he did go in to speak to him last week, didn't we? They went in to give what the hair and blood samples and, and writ writing, but they didn't give official interviews. Right. They didn't talk to him at all. No, they just went in to give. And Patsy didn't go at all because she was all on the Valium and moping right. around the house. Not moping. That's a bad word. She was distraught. Oh, because it says to answer some questions. It wasn't a formal formal uh, interview or anything. Okay. Like they didn't like sit down and actually go through okay any timeline stuff. It, to me, and this it's going to be several months until they do that. Yeah, and to me, this is a first. This is a red flag to me. The way that they just showed up, letting her inter because they dictated it. It was dictated too on what CNN could ask and what they couldn't ask. And mm -hmm. I would assume that was by the lawyers. Sure, but, but it's so like so. What was the point of the interview? Was it, and I'm proud this is debated, was it a public plea for, hey, there's a killer out there, we need to find him? Or was it more, we are innocent, here's our story, and look at us being sad? Well, and we just talked a second ago about their attorney getting tipped off, you know, by a, whoever the inside person was at the DA's office, that they were going to be leaning on them as suspects. So maybe it's a preemptive mood. You know, they're not happy with the police, so they're going to go out to the public and make their case directly to the public. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it. if you feel like the police are already leaning on you, you know that you didn't do this. You're like, well, fuck these cops. I'm going to go on Larry King and, and state make my case, case and, to the public. Yeah. I mean, really, you could see it either way, I guess, yeah. you know. I mean, there's also, you know, behind the scenes discussions going on with, I'm sure, the police, the DA, their, their defense team. Yeah. That you're just not going to know about. Right, exactly. Also on January 1st, details about the crime already had started to leak out. And even though these details were wrong, tabloids ran with it. The first report said that John Bonet had duct tape wrapped around her mouth and neck, which we know from, from part two is not true. But I mean, this is just a week after, after her body was found and they're already throwing out false information. So someone leaking false items? I don't know. I didn't even think of that, like purposely leaking false yeah. stuff. I don't know. I would just taken it as tabloids getting a little tidbit of information and then just going for those attention grabbing headlines and kind of blowing it out of proportion. Mm. Yeah. Probably also likely. Maybe both. Yeah. Hard to say. It's reported a few different ways on when the Ramseys returned to Boulder. Some reports say it was January second, some say it was January third. Regardless, on January third they hired a private investigator, Ellis Armistead because they felt the police were focused too much on them and not other suspects. I get that. I, I don't know. I understand the that logic. Your private investigator before you even talk to the police? Yeah, I just I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. I, I feel like they probably were leaning on him too heavy as, you know. But you had that's the first logical person to clear though. Yeah. You got to clear the people that were in the house. That's just my opinion. I mean, well, I mean, the family members are always going to be first suspects. Of course. But you, get, they have, you have to let them clear people. 
not just hire your own investigator to already muddy up the situation. Yeah, I just get the sense we don't know all the things that went on behind the scenes here for the past week. In what sense? I don't know. It yeah. just seems like there's something that made them not trust the police off the bat. Well, a- unless they probably, did it, maybe that's why. You know, I, I don't know. <laughs> probably the police. I mean, at the from the outside, you know, not even looking at whether or not they did it. Probably the police pressuring them, and then, like we talked about, he's a high profile guy. This is a high profile case. I don't necessarily see this as. I don't know. This doesn't make me feel more. This doesn't make me lean towards more that they're guilty. Because they hired the in private and get investigator. Yeah, I'm not saying anything makes me lean towards they're guilty of anything. I, I I don't see it as that shady. I guess maybe is what yeah. I'm saying. Maybe this is what their attorney advised, and they're just following it, what right. advice. Yeah, I still think if I was innocent, I would have by now went with my attorney to go have my official interview with the police. I think I would have done that. Again, I can't put myself in that situation. But I feel like by this point, I probably would have went with my attorney and had my official interview. Yeah. So, because if I was innocent, I would want to clear my name and then focus on the interview. And I feel like it'd be more important for me to to close the case and find out who did it than it would be to prove, quote, prove my innocence if I knew I was truly innocent. Yeah. So I would want to go with my attorney, sit down, say, OK, let's do this. Let's hash it out. I mean, that's what happens in 99 99- percent of all cases is you just go in with your lawyer and Mm -hmm. and they interview you i can't think of any other case that has started we're only a couple days in and it has already Mm -hmm. started out this way yeah i mean this is a rare occurrence and i'm not saying that they're doing this because they're guilty but i'm what what i'm saying and i think what we all agree they didn't make this investigation easier by doing this um they might but they might have just been looking to protect themselves right i agree with that so this Ellis Armistead was a very established investigator. He was a former police detective and former chief investigator for the Route County DA office. So he's no uh, no slouch when it comes to this stuff. Also on January 3rd, the Boulder mayor pushed back on Patsy's CNN inter- interview where she warned the community and made a statement saying residents shouldn't think a killer is, quote, wandering the streets. And they were not happy with that whole thing. Well. The I mayor, don't know the, that the mayor can just, just convincingly say that. Say that. <laughs> he just wants to make sure his that. town is not going, you know, yeah. crazy. This is Boulder. This is a quiet suburban town. Wasn't you said John Bonet was the only murder in that town for the year of ninety six? Yeah. He does he wants to keep that reputation well, going yeah, and be in a safe, quiet suburban community. Like Haddonfield, Michael Myers is out there slaughtering <laughs> people. We don't talk about that, man. That's that's too much. Well, and the media had already descended on boulder heavy oh, i bet yeah. so i mean i don't blame the mayor for trying to to keep the peace and keep it quiet but I mean, that's what his job is part of it i'm, I'm sure just saying the killer it. might be wandering the streets you can't <laughs> right. definitively say that that's not the case might be two days later on january 5th police obtained a search warrant for the ramsey's vacation home in charlevoix michigan and they removed sergeant larry mason from the investigation after he was accused of being responsible for the leaks now, it's worth noting that an investigation never proved that he was the one leaking to the press. And there's allegations that there's already a rift at this time between the DA and the police department. Mm. And he wasn't backing off on pushing on the Ramses, so he was removed. So it was more of the politic game than it was, quote, leaking to the press or whoever. Well, I would say Steve Thomas is still the lead investigator, right? At right. this point. Right, right. I don't want YouTube to get upset that we weren't aware of that. Wait, who's Steve Thomas? <laughs> he founded Wendy's, right? That's right. <laughs> Man, that triple. God damn, Pally. Although I've been on a spicy nugget kick, just for anyone who's keeping tabs on Mike's diet. Everyone there. is. I know that. Everyone. I know. It's a hot topic. Mm. No, I don't shop at Hot Topic, but thank you. How did I know someone's going to get said <laughs> like that? <laughs> The following day, the Ramseys continued to push forward with things on their own and still had not formally talked to the police. They launched a website regarding the case asking for information. Uh, Courts in Boulder and Charlevoix also sealed search warrant information due to the constant leaking of information. So they removed Larry Mason, but shit was still leaking out. You know, It's crazy. Yeah. The leak in here. So clearly it wasn't. It sounds like that was more just a politic thing. Yeah, I mean, the information's was, still getting out. Yeah, and it was proven that he didn't do it. So, 
Well, it wasn't proven. It was just there was no evidence to support that right. he did do it. Yeah. Yeah. There's more leak in here than a month's worth of Mike's bathroom breaks during the show. And I got to pee right now. I'm told him <laughs> that we're going to continue them. <laughs> On January 8th, 1997, John and Patsy took Burke to the Child Advocacy Center in Niwot, Colorado, through arrangements made by the Boulder Police Department to be interviewed by Dr. Suzanne Bernard, a specialist in child psychology. Now, the details of this interview come from a woman named Bonita Sawyer. This woman, uh, Bonita Sawyer, she stole files regarding the interview for a book she was planning to write about the case. How the story goes is that her nephew got a hold of the transcripts and sold them to the tabloids. Sounds legit. Yeah. So the quote nephew. Yeah, quote nephew. <laughs> she she uh so she worked for this this attorney, Larry Posner, and he had access to the police files. Mm. So basically how the story goes is she copied these and put them back where they were, and then her quote nephew <laughs> sold them to the tabloids. Seems highly illegal. Very illegal. A lot of people wanted um wanted charges to be filed regarding this, including Fleet White. He was one that pushed on that, mm. that wanted charges to be filed, but they never were. Good for Fleet. Yeah. So, I mean, take this with a grain of salt, I guess. Or It's not an official document, but it's claimed to be at least stolen. That's from Burke's interview with a child psychologist. Right. For, this is from his first interview. And there's video clips available, too, of at least some of it, right? Right. I've seen pieces of it. You just find like on YouTube? or Yeah, there's some stuff yeah. out yeah. there, some clips. Mm. When left alone with the psychologist, Burke appeared to be at ease and even told the doctor that he felt safe, even though he did say that he wanted to come that day. Dr. Bernard thought it was unusual for this child to feel safe. People in this entire town didn't feel safe with the concept that someone was running around that could be snatching children, and this was his own sister, and it happened in his own home. Generally speaking, a child who goes through this kind of trauma where a sibling or a family member has been killed, they don't feel safe. Burke described his father as quiet. He was always at work, and his mother worked as a mom. The things he liked most about his mom was that she gave him lots of hugs and kisses, and the thing he liked most about his dad were planes. Throughout the interview, he showed little warmth towards his family, but at the same time was very protective of them. According to Burke, the worst thing they did was not buy him expensive toys. Dr. Bernard explained that most children in interviews will discuss things about the family that angers them, even if they love them. But Burke appeared to have difficulty in opening up about his family, similar to children who can't say things because they feel that there are some things they shouldn't say. Social services had previously provided Dr. Bernard with some history on Burke, which indicated an ongoing bedwetting problem. But Burke denied this, saying that it happened a long time ago. Children are usually honest about this in interviews, and Dr. Bernard wondered why Burke was not. I, he, can I interrupt for a Sure. Mm -hmm. So... Is this information that social services had just gathered in the past couple of days? Or are we saying there was an open file on him? I don't from believe this previous. was just the past couple of days. Okay. So there was, I don't think that's a they're... good question. I didn't even All think right. of that. Is, is so they Burke... both had bedwetting problems. Burke yeah. did. Because she allegedly did too, right? Mm -hmm. Does that run in the family? Between them two. Hmm. Was Burke known to be on the spectrum at all? Is that any information we might have? No. No. I mean, he's just a normal guy. Okay. Just no, a little, I think he's a just different from what I've heard. I've not seen any of the interviews. He's just a little maybe maybe I would be, too, if I lived my whole life in the shadow of being accused of my younger sister's death. If you were railroaded by the fucking yeah. tabloid what, he's media 10, your He's whole 10 life. years old here. Yeah. OK. And again, I we're going going through this whole thing and there's some odd stuff in this. But who knows how the fuck you'd react? I think he was you, nine. Yeah, he was nine at this. Was time. he nine? Mm -hmm. yeah. okay, I'm sorry. You're nine years old and your sister is brutally murdered. And you're maybe being accused of it. We don't know how any how we would react at that age. That's my point with all this. Like, I don't think there is a, a normal that they should expect him to exhibit. You know how kids normally act in this scenario. Based on normal, yeah, he exhibits some odd behavior yeah. as we're going to get through here. But I, again, I don't, I don't necessarily. Well, we'll get into that. I'm, I'm jumping ahead, but I just don't think it's fair to hold that necessarily against him. Right. Well, that's, yeah, that's going to be some of my hot takes in, in part four. That's how we'll people save treat, that. We'll save that. How people treat him. All right. That, that pisses me. That, that's the thing about he's this getting, story. He's wearing a red shirt right now, and his face is matching the color of his shirt, and he's getting fired up. <laughs> All right. Many of Burke's other responses also created areas of concern for the doctor. 
Burke displayed an enormous amount of lack of emotion, almost the point of indifference, which Dr. Bernard explained may be attributed to shock, but could also have been a lack of attachment to his family. Since his mother had appeared very emotional when she brought Burke for the interview, Dr. Bernard thought that perhaps Burke could not deal with the family's emotions and had therefore just withdrawn. Even in response to questions which should have elicited strong emotions, he remained non-expressive. When asked how things have been since your sister died, Burke responded, it's been okay. And when asked if he missed her, he said, yep. Burke continuously told Dr. Bernard that he tried to forget about things and just play his Nintendo. So another question. Um, Yeah, I don't find anything out of the ordinary at all here. No, nine years old, I'd probably be doing the same thing, I think. So when they say expressed uh, areas of concern for the doctor, like areas of concern concern about his well-being or concern that he might be the one that killed her. Well, I think also that goes back or to both. Ian's point of this is what third-hand notes that this, we're this reading, was, right? Pe- this was published in the tabloids as, mm-hmm. as coming from... From the file. It was stolen by some random fucking woman. So right. the doctor never confirmed the contents or the No, 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 I don't think any of this that we're reading is confirmed. Yeah, it's, it's a right. tabloid... But I'm just saying, the it, there's a lot of pieces of the story where it's it's re, it's reported the two different ways, like right. Well, right. things and like that. And we've provided both ways, yeah. so that's right. I don't want people to think that what I'm reading here is is official. It's not the Bible or anything, Mike. No, of course not. We'll read that later after we're done before we go home tonight. I'll read a couple passages to you guys. When asked to draw a picture of his family, he drew a father figure who was distanced from Burke, a mother figure which was the smallest figure in the picture, and Jean Benet was not in the picture at all. Dr. Bernard interpreted the drawing to suggest that Burke felt his father was not emotionally available to him and his mother was insignificant and did not have a great deal of power. Dr. Bernard thought it was extremely abnormal that John Bonet was not in the family picture at all since de- her death had occurred only 13 days prior. Most children continue to include deceased siblings and family drawings years after the death because it is too devastating for them to think about the loss. Burke also told Dr. Bernard that he was getting on with his life another very abnormal reaction for a child who had so recently lost a sibling. When specifically discussing the crime, he related that he did not hear any noises that night and that he was asleep, but he admitted that he usually hears when someone opens the refrigerator downstairs. Dr. Bernard asked what he thought happened to his sister. Burke, showing the first signs of irritation during the interview, responded, I know what happened. She was killed. Burke's explanation to the doctor was someone took her quietly and took her down in the basement, took a knife out, or hit her on the head. He said that the only thing he asked his dad was, where did you find the body? A highly unusual query from a child considering the possible questions a child might ask about the death of a sibling. Dr. Bernard felt that he needed to do, there needed to be more follow-up with Burke in the discussion of sexual contact. The only show of emotion by Burke, other than the irritation with the questions about the actual crime, was when Dr. Bernard began to ask about uncomfortable touching. Burke picked up a board game and put it on his head, an action indicating anxiety or discomfort with these types of questions, and that there was more that he was not telling her. Dr. Bernard asked Burke if he had any secrets, and he said, probably, if I did, I wouldn't tell you, because then it wouldn't be a secret. Smart kid. It's like a mic drop from Burke yeah, at the end. It's, true. <laughs> it's a secret. What the fuck are you fuck asking? You, <laughs> Smart. I, I feel like a lot of that is. It's hard to tell if this like is a hundred percent true. Right. Some of these behaviors might be a little odd, but you also don't know how you would act people, if you were nine years old and your sister was yeah, killed. Of course. People deal with trauma differently. And when he's talking, when... and I'd probably be a little embarrassed too if someone was implying that I might have sexually touched my younger sister. And so, wet your bed and, you know, right. other things you don't want to talk about Very with some right. stranger. Yeah. And, I mean, the thing about him talking about took a knife and or hit her on the head, he's probably overhearing people around him, his parents and lawyers and stuff, talking about the case and, and what happened. I believe he makes a stabbing motion in the, in the video, if I remember seeing it. And Is he, that what he did? I think so. But, and she wasn't stabbed. We know that. So, yeah. I mean, it's... By no means am I saying he's exonerated, but I'm just saying I, I don't think this is enough to hold anybody accountable. Oh, and it's just a subjective opinion of the doctor as well. Allegedly. I mean, I mean Ed, Kemper, we know. Yeah, Ed Kemper's doctor said he was fine, and they let him walk out the door. Well, he, was. So. he was. Same with Richard Chase. They <laughs> yeah, just sent him on his way. way. Wow. They're not always right. <laughs> 
On January 13th, 1997, the leaks continued to happen at a very fast rate, and the Globe published the autopsy photos of John Bonet. Then on the following day, the Ramseys still haven't cooperated with the police by giving an interview, but they hired their own handwriting expert and former FBI profiler, John Douglas. Hero from many past episodes. Yes. But I mean, th- this is this is still, to me, this is still, this is getting more and more weird. Why, well, why won't you talk to the police, but you keep bringing in other experts to muddy up the situation is how I view, I'm starting to view this. With all these leaks and now they're publishing autopsy photos, would you be trusting the police anymore? I'm not sure I would. But how do you know it was the police though? With auto- like in all, in the, I, I don't, I'm just. Because I mean, it could have been someone from the coroner's office mm-hmm. with the autopsy stuff, you know. But I, I get what you're saying too about the leaking and. But they my, fired that guy allegedly for leaking stuff, so I'm sure that got back to them. Yeah. Not fired, but t- took him off the case. My mind keeps going back to if you are truly innocent, why would you not go answer their questions with your attorney to prove your case? Yeah. No. They're not in the public eye. They're not doing themselves any favors by making the investigation more difficult and bringing all these people in. It ju- it doesn't do them any favors. Seems like we're missing a piece here. I don't know. I, I understand the point of protecting yourself, but you know you're going to have to speak to the police at some point. Why would you not go with your attorneys and go give an official interview and then be done with it? Because if you're if you're innocent, you can just get it all over with. Then perhaps why not take that chance? Your attorney's there. He's going to protect you. You know, you got some high powered attorneys. They're not going to let yourself walk into a trap. That's the biggest part of this is that I don't understand is recommended by your corporate attorney that works for fucking Lockheed Martin. You were given these three lawyers, but you don't trust them enough to sit with you in a, in a interview. Well, and we don't know that they didn't trust them enough. No, but that's what it seemed. That's what it comes off as. Why are you? Yeah. Why are you making this so difficult in that sense? But the lawyers might be the ones telling him not to, though. Like we just don't know, right? There's just a piece missing here, I think. And 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 beyond that, publishing the autopsy photos is just fucking disgusting. It's terrible. I have not looked yeah. at them, and I won't. I know you've seen some for for research purposes. Yeah, just because and, I wanted to get more of a a grasp. Well, I'm not on, saying you're yeah. looking at it for for pleasure and just no, want to yeah. see them, right? I mean, so that's the globe, right? So you could be checking out your groceries, standing in line, and open the globe and look at that. Yeah, yeah, okay. And that's yeah, that's gross. I mean, that's every grocery store and store in the country now are plastering pictures of this little girl. Yeah, I remember. It's just vile. Yeah. On January twenty second, nineteen ninety seven, the Ramses refused to take a polygraph test, which I don't blame them for at all. I mean, we've talked about this numerous times with true crime things. Polygraph tests are damned if you do, damned if you don't situation, especially in this case with all the public stuff. You know, if you refuse it, you're you mm-hmm. look suspicious. If you take it and I mean all the stress and you have all these leaks and all this public shit going on, you're probably no, gonna fail it. Nothing good can come from it. Because even if right. you pass it, they're gonna say, Well, it was just a flawed test and we're gonna throw that out and not have that used in court. And then well, if you fail it, it's gonna make the news. But there's a reason they're not admissible because they're not accurate. So right. they don't really serve. It holds any about as much weight as hypnosis. It's just garbage. <laughs> I don't know about that, but <laughs> oh, it is. <laughs> hypnosis has never been used in court. They, they try. No, they did the satanic panic thing mm. from the '80s. Remember, they got people are like getting in trouble for we'll have that. To cover shit. that. That sounds like a fun. One. Yeah, like under hypnosis, the re- <laughs> yeah. regressive memories, and they, oh, my daycare worker uh, molested me when I was four. Without any, you know, corroborating mm-hmm. physical evidence or anything. Yeah. That, we'll have to get into that another time. I have so many questions about <laughs> yeah. what was just said, but I don't want to derail us. So, well, just putting innocent people in jail based on falsified memories brought about by you know, by, by a fake hypnosis. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, but I, I don't see anything. There's nothing off about this at all. I would never... Take I would, a polygraph I wouldn't test. either. Absolutely yeah, that not. That sounds stupid. I would say you can think I'm as guilty as you want. Fuck off. I'm not taking it. God, settle down, John Ramsey. <laughs> <laughs> On March 1st, 1997, University of Colorado law professor Patrick Furman was hired to join Patrick Burke in representing Patsy. And then two days later, Patsy submitted 
her third handwriting sample. So they're they're cooperating to a degree with the handwriting sample yeah. stuff, but they've also they're, hired they're their They're picking own. and choosing with what they're going to... It really just seems like the only thing they're not doing is giving the official interview. Sitting down talking. Sitting down talking with the, with the, uh, the police. Right. Okay. On March 6, 1997, authorities officially cleared John's adult children, John Andrew and Melinda Ramsey. This is by evidence samples submitted, like the handwriting, stuff like that, and the fact that they had solid alibis, that they were not in Boulder at the time. Weren't they in Michigan? Um, they, Minneapolis? Or, Minneapolis. They flew yeah. from yeah. Minneapolis. So they couldn't clear them on December 27th <laughs> since they weren't there? Well, you know what? Actually, there are there were some reports that said that they cleared them really early like okay. a couple days after yeah. and then this one this march 6th maybe to me seemed more credible maybe than publicly the other report. they cleared yeah. them at that point maybe unofficially they cleared them early but publicly yeah, they did maybe just to, to you know dot their i's and cross their t's and make sure they had everything yeah this is just another one of those little details it's like wait wh who's saying what you know what's true here and what's, what's i don't blame them for waiting a few months for before going public with that with something like that i mean they probably cleared them a while ago I mean, it's very easy to clear them if they weren't even in the same you know they're halfway across the country and, and throughout this this timeline that we're going through they were giving public statements constantly the police were were out there talking about this to because they just have the media hounding them relentlessly over this. Mm. So well, and I wonder how much of that was to keep up with the Ramseys doing their public thing. Yeah, like they're they're saying this. Okay, but here's where our investigation is. Right. Should they be doing that though? I don't know. I mean, probably not giving out information. Maybe maybe clearing people. Sure. Yeah, I don't, I don't see. I don't think either side should be going so public personally. On March 12, 1997, the Boulder DA hired retired Detective Lou Smith to work on the case. And here's where you kind of officially get into where the DA office and the police aren't being able to work together. The police weren't happy with Lou Smith being brought in, and they banned him from what they called the war room, which was like their yeah. the evidence and well, all the stuff. Essentially, is it the DA saying you cops are not good enough to work with, so we're going to hire our own retired detective and let him put him on the case? Yep. And the <laughs> I cops, can't imagine why they wouldn't like that. Well, the cops weren't good enough until Steve Thomas, founder of the Wendy's Triple, came in <laughs> and cleaned things up, though, right? Like, that's when the investigation got better. Yeah. I, I thought he was the guy from day one. Well, he wasn't there. No. He was playing catch up the day after. Remember, he was on holiday vacation? I mean, well, yeah, but... He was from, so from he, almost day one. With the first day when it was all bungled, he, he wasn't was on there. site. Right? Yeah. When he showed up, I think it's when they started posting up police 24 7. And yeah. And if you look at his his official notes, he's for that first day, he's got all kind of times written down. And and some people will say, like, well, look at, look at his notes. His notes are all fucked up. He's got the same person showing up at different times. And he's like, I'm telling, I'm writing down what's reported to me. And until I can figure out what's accurate, I'm leaving it all there because I'm not just gonna just roll with to, something. Like, it being his like uh, robe, drinking some eggnog by a Christmas tree, and now he's you know he's doing a murder investigation from his you know home in Florida or something. On April fourth, nineteen ninety seven, the Ramses have still not sat down with the police, but start the John Benet Ramsey Foundation with John Ramsey listed as the vice president and treasurer. And Patsy Ramsey listed as president and secretary. Seems a little odd to me. I was going to say, Dave, what do you think? Do the attorneys again tell him to do this? I was just asking questions earlier. <laughs> it just seems we're missing a piece here is all. I wasn't saying anything concrete. This seems strange, though. I don't know. It's like That's just three so months quick. later. That's so quick. Yeah. And you still haven't talked to the police to clear you. Yeah. You're the not. You are the number one suspect. You're that's gonna be what, by default. That's what I keep going back to is if I'm truly innocent, I'm talking to the police relatively quickly in a timely manner with my attorney. I'm gonna talk to the police if I'm truly innocent. Unless the police have done or said something that leads you to believe they've already made up their minds about you. But then, wouldn't at this point, I feel like the Ramses would have come out publicly and said something about that if they're already doing CNN inter interviews. You know, why would they not at this point? They're clearly not worrying about the investigation yeah. and if it's going to lead any results. So if I'm them and the police have said something public to me, then I'm going to go on Larry King and say, well, they've already fucking told me this. So here's here's my argument why I'm not. Yeah. 
And then I think that holds some weight. If they came out and said that, and I heard that, I'm thinking, okay, these people might have something here. These police are after them with no good reason, you know, if they're coming out saying this. From my understanding, they just wanted to talk to him to get their version of how things went down that night. Is all that is all that was initially wanted yeah. to be well, done I mean, if here. nothing else is at play, then yeah, it's it's very strange. I mean, they were physically the closest people to the murder, right? So obviously, they're going to want to at least maybe maybe they're going to say something in their interviews that the police could say, "Oh, we could use that. That might help us find the murderer." Maybe they heard something in the middle of the night, or they remember something that they didn't think of earlier. You know, they they were physically the closest people there. You're going to want to give a statement or some answer yeah. some questions at least. I don't disagree at all. I'm just trying to find a reason for them to behave this way and not want to do that. Right. Other than because they're guilty. <laughs> and right. it's tough to do that. And maybe, maybe that's the reason and why. And again, I'm not trying to put myself in the place of them because we all would act differently to your child being brutally murdered. So I'm not trying to say that they handled it right, they handled it wrong, but they did hinder the investigation. Knowingly hindered the investigation. I think that's true. Yeah, because, I mean, at this point, other people have cooperated. I mean, other people that were there that night have cooperated. Fleet White and Priscilla White mm-hmm. have cooperated. The Fernies have cooperated. It, it, now you're talking, what, five months later? How can... It, the other, the other big it, thing with that, too, is how, after five months, how well is your rec- recollection exactly of that sure. night, too? I agree. Comes into play. I mean, it's a matter of days before you start losing recollection of things. I can't tell you what I did a couple of days ago, to be honest. That's what, actually, I was thinking that one time. I was like, uh, there was a crime thing I was watching on Netflix about somebody that was innocent and got in trouble mm. and, and was sent to jail because they couldn't like remember some certain things. There was a lot of other stuff at play. But I'm like, God damn, if I was ever in a situation like that, and they were like, what would you do on, you know, March nineteenth, whatever. Let's I be honest. I, I didn't. You didn't leave your house. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ninety nine point nine percent chance you'll be right. See, I'll, that's I'll never be in trouble for anything because I don't go don't anywhere. I was in my basement. <laughs> so wait, I have a quick Hang question out. then. So like one of the things, and we'll probably get to this next week as well when we talk about suspects. But last week we talked about that bowl of pineapple, mm-hmm. and one of the things that always sticks out in my head is that uh, Patsy Ramsey said she doesn't even remember buying pineapple. Right. When did she actually say that then? Was that four or five months later when she actually spoke to the police? Or was that right at the time? Or do we even know, is that just what eventually came out? It's been brought because up in interviews. I know that with that's her talking. That's always stuck out to me is, and maybe right away she wouldn't think of that, but you would probably know if you had, if you regularly bought pineapple. Or I think we had said earlier, maybe it was John Bonet's favorite few, fruit. So she would probably know whether or not she had it in stock because if it's your daughter's favorite fruit, you know whether or not it's on your list or if you need to buy it. And that always just... But then there's other things me. where it's like, well, she never even really ate pineapple. So so it was Some things say it's her favorite okay. fruit. Some say that she never even ate it, really. But my, I guess that was just like questions like that, like where her statement about the pineapple, did that come out months later? When who the fuck knows if you would remember if you had that in your house? Yeah. Or... Did that come out right away? I'm assuming it didn't come out right away because she didn't give many of those public statements or she was jacked up on volume and, you know, whatever else. And at this point, the the official autopsy report has not been released to the public or not the, the public release has not. So she wasn't either. even being questioned at this point. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Good question, though. Well, so that mean that leads me to believe if the for if the, it, when the autopsy comes out, which is when like eight or ten months in the 97 or, you know, something like that. Yeah, we're going to we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So she, so, so I guess they were asking her almost a year later, did you have pineapple in your house? Who the fuck's going to remember something like that? So I, 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 I'm just me. going through my own questions in my own head. Yeah. Like I always question the fact that she said she had no pineapple in the house. Well, if you're asking her a year later, of course she's not going to remember. Maybe there was pineapple in the house. And to me, that makes a difference with the story. You know, you don't have someone bringing it in because they already know John Bonet likes it or requests it. Maybe it was already in the house. Right. And, I mean, she could have woke up on her own then and went and got the pineapple. And that's something could have. we'll get into we'll get part into four. Right. This is the things I think about throughout the week, folks. It's little things. Have you been pondering it all week? I actually have. The pineapple thing has stuck with me. It's a... Mostly because those fucks with the pizza and bring it up every <laughs> goddamn day. 
Bunch of culinary bozos, if you ask me. <laughs> bozos. <laughs> wow. Direct those hate messages at Dave. That was not it. That was not me. On April 11th, 1997, Patsy Ramsey submitted a fourth handwriting sample. And then four days later, the Boulder Police Department publicly requested a fifth sample from her in a press release. Why? She's given them four, but then they got to go out and publicly request the yeah, fifth. That's a lot. I think that's they're getting lot. frustrated at this point because they won't speak to them and they're getting stonewalled at every turn. So now it's kind of turning into, well, we're just going to publicly put the heat on them right back is kind of what it's turning into. Yeah, they're getting pissy. I don't believe handwriting analysis is a legitimate science to begin with. I think it's highly questionable. It's, I agree. It's Yeah, it's debatable. Yeah, it's got to be. I mean, I think there's th- there's something to it for sure, but I think it's uh, it's I think debatable. it's highly subjective. I don't know. I was I was doing some research on it, and there's a lot of federal court rulings, you know, questioning the legitimacy of handwriting analysis. Handwriting analysis or uh, lie detector tests? What do you put more faith in? Neither, because I don't think they're a hundred percent. Okay. No, I agree. I think I it's mean, both, think both junk bullshit, science. Yeah. So I don't know how much credence this handwriting analysis part. Holds. I there's maybe a little to it. You might catch something that's consistent in all of them. Maybe it's not a science. You're just looking. You're you're grasping at straws, hoping yeah. to catch something. Maybe the way she crosses her T's is consistent in all four or five samples that you can you can match up. Even if you could, you're you're you don't have a lot, but you have something. It's not a science. It's not going to get a conviction. Well. Or does it sometimes? I, I mean, does it? Does it come down to a handwriting sample? I don't know. I mean, you're in this your, case, it's not. It's not going to. You're putting your faith in the jury at that point, whether or not they believe it. I mean, you're going to charge someone simply because of of the way they cross their T's. I don't know. Maybe mm. not a, a rich, well off person in this social standing. Yeah. I don't believe in juries either. Yeah, we've talked about that before. I wouldn't do it either. I'd say, mm. give me the judge. Most people are imbeciles. I trust them to <laughs> logically pick apart evidence and figure out what's real, what's not real. They should just send all the evidence to Necronomapod. We'll lay it out for you and <laughs> make a decision from there. Thumbs up or thumbs down on our Instagram post, whether or not you live or die. I mean, what is it, like 45% of people in this country believe in angels? You want, you know, you want those four people <laughs> on your jury deciding your fate? People that believe in angels? <laughs> I'll take the judge. Yeah, the jury selection is kind of weird, especially in like high profile things. Because mm-hmm. it's basically like, do you know anything about anything? Do you follow anything in the world? No. All like, right, you're, you're dumb, on the jury. How, how dumb are you? Okay, you're on the jury. <laughs> exactly. So you get ninety percent of people that believe in angels on your jury. <laughs> fucking Toby Flenderson gets on the jury for fucking <laughs> Scranton Strangler. We can't get on the jury. <laughs> On April 18th, 1997, the Boulder DA, Alex Hunter, publicly named the Ramseys as, as suspects, saying they are, quote, under an umbrella of suspicion. And in turn, the, the Ramsey lawyers came back hard on the Boulder police for not investigating the crime pro- properly and looking at all the suspects. Me personally, based on that announcement from the DA and then the lawyer's response, it's like, well, Talk, just give the fucking interview. Give the interview. Mm-hmm. Let them at least say what happened that night, your version of events. So I have a quick question. Um, I don't disagree with you, but I know in, in part four, we're going to talk about some other suspects, the, what is it, Santa Bill and whoever else. Right. Are police investigating that? Or yeah. do we? is there not much information known? Because we haven't touched on any other people being investigated through the three parts we've done so far. So it's reported a few different ways the, uh, on the actual number, but the one you see a lot is 160. The Ramseys gave a list of 160 people to look at, and that includes people we're going to get into next week, like Bill McReynolds. We're going to get into... The maid. Yeah, we're going to get That's into what I her. Mean. Like, so they were actively looking into these people, mm-hmm. and which they were we will get people. into next week, and they were clearing a lot of these people. Mm-hmm. Okay, I just wanted because we we've only really touched on the Ramsey so far, right? And so I just wanted to make sure people knew, or that I knew even that those other people we're going to talk about next week, and they may have been cleared for whatever reasons, or it just didn't pan out or go anywhere. The right. investigations, okay. Yeah, and that's the thing with this where 
the their lawyers say that they're not investigating the crime properly it's like well they are talking to other people you the people that were there the parents of john benet that were there that night you're not talking so how the fuck are we supposed to investigate this you if, would think you would start with those people and then based on their answers you clear them and then you go from there based on who they suspect what they've told you who they think might have done it yeah, I would be upset if I was a cop too and they were like, don't question me. Here's 160 people I think you should look at. Well, no, motherfucker. I want to talk to you first. You were there. You're you the prime there. eyewitness. So I do understand that point as well. Yeah. I don't know. But I do understand Dave's point that if they're coming at them and coming at them and coming at them, you're going to protect yourself. Or did the attorneys feel that they weren't capable of providing an adequate statement to clear themselves and they just... Rightly so, figured stonewalling the cops is a better course of action. I mean, there. Look, I'm not saying that they're guilty of anything, but I mean, there is. You know, what do they call it? The privilege, uh, the client privilege stuff, where you can tell your lawyer, "Yeah, I did it," but now you're going to cover my ass, kind of thing. He's not in jail today, so yeah. So I mean, if they're like, well, and there's also these guys can't get their story straight, but we're getting paid. And we're not going to talk to the cops, but we're going to make a bet that they don't have enough physical evidence to get an indictment. So that's what we're going to do. There's yeah. also that weird shit, which I still don't buy from the first episode. Was it first or second? I don't even remember at this point where fucking John has all those broken windows around the house. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's highly suspicious. But if that was and I don't buy that, I don't necessarily buy that. But if that were true. If you're the, my attorney, Dave, and I'm telling you that, you're probably going to tell me, yeah, don't talk to the cops because there's all these broken windows in your house that you didn't fix that are wide open that now have your fingerprints or for whatever reason, um, you know, you could or or why did you break them? Were they broken for a reason? They're going to pin it back on you for letting someone in. See, so th exactly. there is questions to be made for that. I still think it's fucking weird in the middle of winter in Colorado in like your kid's playroom in the basement, you have a broken window. Yeah, that's like that's going to be, that's going to be zero degrees in that, that basement. That's going to be free. Everything about this is weird. And maybe that's what the attorneys, you know, Yeah, I just, I don't determined. know. I don't, I don't necessarily buy that whole, Oh, I'm John. I broke windows to get into my house thing. And there was broken windows all over. But if you're the attorney and he's telling you this, maybe that is enough to say, all right, shut up then. Because that does make you look suspicious, and they're going to put this right back on you if you talk. There, I mean, I think there's, I can understand that at least. I'm not saying I agree with it, but I understand it. Wouldn't it be possible, though, to sit down for an interview, and if a question like that got asked, your lawyer would be like, don't answer that question? Yeah, I think yes. so. Yeah. You have to answer Which is why I've been saying, <laughs> right. so you have your attorney, sit down, answer, do, you, do your official interview to at least appease the cops and get them off your back. Yeah. I, I, I think so. At least sit down and do it. And then, you know, even if you don't don't even answer half their questions, at least you sat down and, and your lawyer could just sit there the whole time or That's, mo most of the time be like, don't don't answer that. I mean, we can question all we want, but it, it worked. I mean, none of them were ever indicted for anything. So, right. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I mean, that, you know, the outcome of that is that one of them did it, though. So someone did it. Someone, obviously. Are you saying one of them? I'm saying if they actually did it and and their lawyers determined the best course of action was not to talk to the police, it, it worked ultimately because none of them were ever indicted. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we're doing four parts on this. <laughs> Dissecting every bit of information. On April 30th, 1997, John and Patsy gave their first formal interviews to the police at the Boulder County Justice Center. Patsy was interrogated for six and a half hours and John was interrogated for two hours. Full transcripts are online if anybody's interested, but it's... There you go. They talked. Yeah, what? Hmm. Four months later. Why was Patsy six and a half and John two? I think this did is... Did he just straight up... Because I think they I thought wanna... she did it more than him, right? Yeah, because, I mean, we're going to get to the handwriting stuff here, but the, the handwriting is pointing towards her. And I don't want to keep jumping ahead to part four. But so many people I talk to, whether it be our listeners or in the Discord or people just in regular life, the most two common answers I hear are Burke and Patsy is who people think did it. And there is, up until this point, no hard evidence to support either of those. 
So why are people so passionate that it's them? So, and maybe, we'll, maybe I'm jumping ahead and that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll wait. Yeah. I don't know. That's just where my head's at. I think it's probably the easiest scenario. No, I won't even dignify <laughs> that with a response. You amateur. <laughs> On May 1st, 1997, John and Patsy gave a rare interview with reporters to declare their innocence. Uh, John Ramsey said, quote, I did not kill my daughter. And Patsy said, quote, let me assure you, I did not kill John Bonet. All right. We'll see you guys well, later. Well, I'm convinced. <laughs> we'll see you guys next week when we're going to start a new subject. <laughs> On May 20th, 1997, Patsy submitted a fifth handwriting sample and the Boulder Police Department made a public statement to show that she was cooperating. What a nice gesture. (laughs) After they're putting the heat on her. Yeah. It was also like, what, a month and 10 days later after they requested it. April 11th. Her fucking hands were probably cramped from all these (laughs) handwriting samples. Take my strong hand. (laughs) On June 27th, 1997, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation completed their analysis of Patsy's fifth handwriting sample and determined, in their opinion, John Ramsey did not write the note, but Patsy's results were inconclusive, so they couldn't rule her out. So she's not guilty. They just couldn't rule her out. Right. It's the same same thing as if you uh, took a polygraph and they're like, yeah, it's inconclusive. Mm -hmm. It, it's anything. a damned if you do it's always but in the public mind it's a that's right it's gonna it's be guilt like, yeah because yeah. you, you see that and you're like oh she she did it for sure so dave in your mind she probably shouldn't have submitted all those handwriting samples maybe stop probably one not or two. no because i don't believe i believe it's junk science i don't believe it proves anything you don't think there's any benefit to having at least one handwriting sample i mean if you have this ransom I note no i don't I, think it hurts to take one don't you feel like you could write a handwriting sample in a different way. I do. I actually, yeah. I right. Do. Well, they, they, what well, they, the one thing that, that forensic website that I like, they had, uh, what they say, they take four or five of past writings, like random things that you've written mm-hmm. before and then a fresh one. And then they go about it that way. So it's not just like you write and they compare like the one that you just wrote compared. Cause I guess there is like how you were saying cross the T's there's habits. Mm-hmm. I just feel like there. I could, you take my writing and I have chicken scratch handwriting. And then if you told me to write a sample, I could do something in cursive. That's just completely different. And then be like, well, that's my sample. And then, yeah, but then they're looking, they like get old stuff from you. Right. But they're like, okay, you wrote in cursive, like an asshole on this one on purpose. And all these other, (laughs) Well, but if I was writing a ransom note, my point is I wouldn't write the way I know. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why I think someone did it with their left hand. But if you look at the note, it looks like, they maybe switched halfway through. It looks like, and I think we talked about this last week. It looks like someone started it with their like non-dominant hand, then switched to their dominant hand. But one of these, either the fourth or fifth sample, didn't they ask Patsy to write it with her left hand? Didn't they sneak that in on her? I believe so. Yeah. So they're tricking her up. Now that would be a better test, I think. They because tried it. You can't do as much with your left hand. You know, you wouldn't be able to fancy it up with your non-dominant hand. I would imagine. They call that the stranger, right? They make you do the handwriting <laughs> sample with your left hand. <laughs> yep. After you sit on it for an hour, right? <laughs> right? Okay. We've had too much fun with this one. On July 24th, 1997, the relationship between the police and the DA got worse when the police accepted pro bono representation from three Denver lawyers, Dan Hoffman, Richard Baer, and Robert Miller. So, so, so the cops like, oh, DA, you're gonna hire a, a cop, or well, we're gonna hire a quasi DA attorneys, <laughs> yep, to assist. And these guys were, uh, their credentials were super long, but these guys were no slouches either. Mm. These were some very high profile lawyers that they brought in. And the police were like, fine, you're gonna fucking railroad us. We're gonna railroad you right back, and we're gonna lawyer up. Yep. And at the end of the day. There's a six-year-old kid that was raped and yeah. murdered, yeah. and everybody's playing this politic and the stonewalling game. On July 29th, 1997, at the request of the Boulder Police Department, a company called Seraph Security Consulting and Training Company analyzed the ransom note and crime scene evidence. A profile of the ransom note writer and, and killer they came up with closely matched Patsy Ramsey. Now, this company does not seem very reliable. 
No, you no, know they do not. So I, I don't, uh, I don't the, put much. Well, their police were working on a budget after hiring <laughs> those high profile lawyers. <laughs> I, I, yeah, this this company comes to some results that are pretty questionable, in my opinion. How do you profile a killer solely based on a ransom note? Yeah, I mean that would be if I was going to trust something like that, I would put it in the hands of the FBI's. Uh, profiling unit like john douglas you're gonna call people. john douglas who's working for the other team at this point <laughs> right yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you call rustler have him go head to head yeah right <laughs> that's like the the death match of uh <laughs> <laughs> behavioral science <Right. laughs> so as this as this rift continued to grow between the ramses and the boulder police department Patsy called into the Larry King live show on September 2nd, 1997 to voice her concerns about how the tabloid press had been covering the case. Patsy, you're on the air. (laughs) (laughs) Throughout the next few months, the tabloid coverage continued daily and the first round of books began to be published about the case, which I don't understand how, because through this last date of July 29th, 1997, in our next date, which is January 15th, 1998, the autopsy report was released to the public oh, interesting. just within those couple months. So and we've already got multiple books being published. So it's just going to... People are just trying to capitalize. Mm-hmm. And it's just going to mm-hmm. spread false information because no one knows anything at this point. The, the Ramses has only talked once. They, we just got the handwriting thing not that long ago. I remember the glo- I saw in the documentary the the Globe reporter guy said that when they had pictures of or they had John Bonet on the front cover they sold an extra half a million copies a week so his directive was to have a new story and pictures every week yeah yeah I mean I mean, we talked about it last week they everybody saw what what OJ Simpson did for their sales yeah so we got we have our new one now let's we're gonna make every dollar we can out of this. On January 15th, 1998, while still publicly being labeled as suspects by the police, the Ramses refused to do any more interviews with the police unless they could review the evidence that the police have. Oh, so the police just gave it over to them? No. Oh, they didn't? <laughs> that, that doesn't sound That's weird, typical. right? They didn't give it over to them. <laughs> you can't do... They haven't been cleared. They're not going to be like, oh, yeah, like, we'll let you see everything that we have on the yeah. table. And- so that you can just go and pick it apart and make up your own evidence against it in your own story they're still the main suspects at this point right Right. they haven't been cleared they've only talked for one time and it was their first you can if anybody's really that interested because patsy's is six and a half hours so that transcript is fucking huge and i admittedly did not read the whole thing Mm. but it's just the basic you didn't read all that i did not we're fucking sitting here right now talking about this you didn't read it all (laughs) it's just an event like their version of events and a lot of it's like their background, like getting a, you know, they're like easing her into the conversation, like asking Patty about her childhood and, mm-hmm. you know, her beauty pageant stuff. And was she one Miss West Virginia? Yeah. Just throwing that out there. For what purpose are you throwing that out nope, there? Just, that's, just, that's what she won. <laughs> Facts only on this show. She won Miss West Virginia. I sense an undercurrent in, your, in the tone of your comment. <laughs> that's, did she not win Miss West Virginia? She did. Or like teen West Virginia. I don't know if it was actual Miss West Virginia. It was. Oh, was it? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, of course they're not going to give them, let them see the, the evidence. It's just completely ridiculous. After some negotiating with the Ramses and their lawyers, the Ramses turned over the clothing that they were wearing the night John Bonet died to the Boulder police for testing. You mean fucking 13 months <laughs> right. after the murder, they're going to turn over clothing? But this is this is what I mean about this makes them look so suspicious. Like it doesn't it's help. It's been a year over a year and you're and you're arguing about giving your clothes over. But why didn't the police get it the first day with the search warrant though? It from We what talked is, about that earlier. We're saying that that wasn't included, but we're not we don't know we for don't know. sure, but according to like people like Steve Thomas and stuff, it was they were told what they could take and what they couldn't. So I guess, and from what we know, Steve Thomas is pretty a straight up legit guy. Other than that claim, that claim about the receipt that linked the rope back to them, that cannot be proven. I mean, but a lot of what he says can't officially be proven. You got to have to take his 
what did he say? Yeah, I know we talked about this, but what did he say about he that? He said he there was a receipt for that rope that was used to make the garage that was linked back to the Ramses. For the exact amount. For the exact amount of length of rope. And but that couldn't be proven. Right. That was Other claimed. Than that, everything else he he has stated has been pretty straight up. And the investigation actually took some integrity when he got back involved. Yeah, I mean he and, and organization and was well done. Right. I mean he was very thorough about I mean it's the the fact that the coroner used the different uh finger Nail or use the same fingernail clippers and right. use them on multiple bodies. That came from his investigating. He mm. proved that. So for all we know, like he's just a straight up honest guy who was. We have no reason to question a lot of what he says. I don't think so, or any of what he says. Yeah. Okay. It's just with the rope thing, you can't put your stamp of approval uh, on that because that's just claimed. There's no. Yeah. You know that's a pretty big claim to make too. I just I. <sighs> I don't know. I put myself in their shoes and you're uh, over a year later, you've given them an interview. You've given them this, you've given them five handwriting samples and they come to you, but none of it they've done easily. They've done nothing. They fought everything, but then they come back and they want clothes from a year ago. I mean, at that point, well, they like, probably have been asking it for, for, for it for a year. Well, do we know that? I don't know that. I would they've hope been arguing for a year about handing over clothes. Like I, nobody could get, a search warrant to, well, again, to seize those after a year. Again, like there's something know, else going on. We don't here. know what's been played behind the scenes. I would imagine the police would have been asking for that since day one, you would, or at least as soon. But as if Steve it was Thomas me, they wouldn't it. be asking. They would have a search warrant, and they would take. They would empty my house out. Of but course, then, they would take what I was wearing. But then maybe the search warrant didn't allow that. I, that's what I don't know. Like maybe that's more behind on. the scenes stuff that. Maybe behind the scenes on the police standpoint that we don't know about where they, they couldn't do it. I would hope they didn't wait 13 months to ask for the clothes that they were wearing that night. You would imagine that would be within 24 hours they were asking for something like exactly that. Exactly Within 24 right. hours. So at this point, sure, give it to them 13 months later. And the fact that it took negotiating is still is odd. It's it's odd, yeah. Thirteen months later, it's it, it's irrelevant for testing purposes. I mean, you could have done anything. <laughs> yeah, they right. could have easily said, "Yeah, we don't even have those clothes anymore." Right. You know. And maybe if you were guilty, you would have thrown them away and not had them. Yeah, you would have burned them the next day. Yeah. So of course, that's true too. At least I would have. My criminal mind. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you changed to go do the murder and then change back. Oh, your criminal mind is better than my criminal mind. We'll know if we get invited over for a bonfire and there's just a bunch of clothes sitting on the uh, the fire. Guys, these are my murder clothes. Don't mind those. They're going to provide our warmth for us tonight. (laughs) Don't worry about them. On February 6th, 1998, the Ramseys put their Boulder home up for sale and planned to permanently relocate to to Atlanta, Georgia. A few days later, DA Alex Hunter publicly said that the investigation was at a standstill because of the Ramsey's refusal to cooperate with investigators. March 12, 1998, the police publicly request that DA Alex Hunter convene a grand jury regarding the case. And on May 27, 1998, the police released a statement that they would be formally presenting the case to the DA. And then we move to June 1st, 1998. Boulder police spent two days presenting the results of their investigation to DA, Alex Hunter's prosecutorial team, and outside advisors, including forensic expert Dr. Henry Lee and DNA specialist Barry Schacht. From the OJ team, Barry Schacht. Yep. He was... He, I know that sounded familiar. If, if watching that trial footage, man, he was aggressive with that, with his... Uh, mm-hmm. It worked. Yep. If the DNA strands don't fit, you must have quit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was, man, Barry Shuck's, uh he was good. trial stuff, man. He he wasn't playing around. He ripped up the, uh, like the, was it the fingerprint guy from the crime, uh, the, the L.A. County Crime Lab? The that guy, guy that, yeah, that, uh, the guy that collected all the evidence. Yeah. He shredded that yeah. fucking guy. Absolutely yep. destroyed. That, that guy looked like he was a deer in headlights <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with, with Barry Shuck. So they did this at the University of Colorado's Coors Event Center. Police presented more than 30,000 pages of evidence to a total of 16 criminal justice experts. Mm. Through June 10th and June 12th, 1998, Burke Ramsey was questioned by Detective Dan Schuler representing the DA office. 
Then starting June 24th and lasting for three days, John and Patsy were interviewed separately by investigators and prosecutors from the DA's office. So now they don't have a choice about, uh, about talking. Does she want to contempt the court charge? Yeah. On August 6, 1998, Steve Thomas resigned from the Boulder Police Department, and his letter said that DA Alex Hunter's office is, quote, thoroughly compromised and has, quote, crippled the case. Steve Thomas claimed critical evidence had not been collected and maintained that other evidence was not tested. Hmm. Hmm. So our, the police are in charge of collecting the evidence. So does that mean that the DA wouldn't sign off on search warrants and things that's, like that? That's what he alludes to because he, point, he Which points would speak out. back to the clothing, the, yeah. the beaver coats, the pajamas or whatever they were sleeping in. I, the fur coats or something he specifically points to. Beaver. Be- beaver. Please, beaver. We were called out for not knowing that beaver fur coats were a thing last episode. <laughs> Just saying. I found out a lot about fur, actually, when I was uh, doing my quick Google search. I thought it was all made out of possum. Whatever. <laughs> no big deal. I prefer beavers to be fur-free. That's just my personal preference. All right. Hey, I like squirrels. <laughs> I like turtles. That's what it, re- that's what it reminded me of. <laughs> really? It sounded like that. <laughs> If anyone out there has not seen the I Like Turtles video, go please YouTube that. So this this whole laughing makes sense. On August 8th, 1998, Governor, or Colorado Governor Roy Romer announced that the Ramsey case would be seen by a grand jury. However, he refused a second request to appoint a special prosecutor because throughout this, Fleet White had been uh, actively requesting a special prosecutor and more specifically something to happen with this case because it's been at a standstill and reminding everyone if fleet white was the guy that was with john when they found her body and yes. at the, the party the the night before they were at the fleet's party right yeah we'll be right back i like turtles today's episode of necronomapod is brought to you by beardology there are a lot of imitators out there but there's only one place i buy my beard oil beardology beard oil nourishes your skin and won't leave you with that greasy feel With over 17 cents available in their extensive product line, I trust my beard to Beardology. You can find Beardology at beardology.co. Use code NECRO15 to receive 15% off your purchase. Beardology, discover the best way to avoid the shave. All right, so this this letter from Fleet is is nine pages long. Obviously, we're not going to go through and read all of that, so we've picked out a few... uh, big paragraphs that we wanted to read some of the one the hard-hitting ones and uh and then we'll we'll maybe talk about it at the end but it i mean i guess to sum up in the beginning it looks like fleet is the only one out here kind of looking for justice in yeah the end for this yeah so after this grand jury thing got announced on august 17th of 98 yeah it really seemed like he had finally had enough of uh of just the, all of the, it yeah and, the investigation all of it and he had been behind the scenes trying to get something done all along yeah writing to the governor and mm-hmm. and other things and with this he just finally was like you know and 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 we should make mention we talked about in episode one fleet and his wife the whites they were close with the ramses mm-hmm. fleet was right behind john when john found john benet's body in the basement he was with him mm-hmm. yeah and and so this is coming from a guy who for as much as we know, was completely innocent and truly cared about this family and is seeing this investigation go all to hell. And also interesting to note, I read that the Ramses and the Whites were estranged by the time of John Bonet's funeral. So what happened there? I don't it was know. in four days. Right. They were the first ones they called on right. the 26th. And they said by the time of her funeral, they were already estranged. Yeah. Something happened there. Did yeah. F- Fleet ever talk to the police? Yeah. Yeah, he fully cooperated. And right any, but I mean, like about what John was doing that day, because on that that day, John was act was you know gone for ninety minutes, came back. Yeah. Like, what did Fleet say? Maybe that caused a rift. What did Fleet ask John that caused a rift? That the, the Ramses were like, "Well, no, fuck you guys. You're you're not a part of us anymore." Exactly. This is what I mean about how I was texting you guys after I did this outline, and I'm like, now I'm fucking confused again because mm. part two, I was like. You know, came to my, I had some, some, all right, what I felt were strong opinions. And then I did all this research and I'm like, now I don't know what to think. 
I take back everything bad I said about the name Fleet in part one <laughs> of our episode. I was not speaking of the person. I was speaking of the name. I found out who the person was reading this letter. Mm, this is yep. a person who's got a hard on for justice. <laughs> a hard on for justice. <laughs> So I'm going to skip ahead to, I think it's like the fifth paragraph of this letter. And I think you can find the letter online, right? We talked about. Yeah, it was kind of tough to find the full one, but I have it saved. If anybody so wants it, link. send us a DM. We'll send it to you or we'll email it to you. Um, but I'm going to skip ahead and just kind of read some of the bullet point paragraphs of uh, of this open letter that Fleet and his wife. Uh, what's his wife's name? I'm sorry. Priscilla. Fleet and Priscilla wrote back in... Uh, was it 98 recently Boulder police detective, Steve Thomas, an investigator on the John Bonet Ramsey murder case left the department in disgust in his August 6th letter of the resignation. He publicly accused the district attorney of obstructing the police investigation and allowing politics to trump justice. He asked that a special prosecutor be brought in to handle the case. We knew John Bonet and her parents very well and have been closely involved in the investigation as witnesses. During the past year, we have also come to know and respect Mr. Thomas and were saddened and discouraged by his departure from the investigation. We share Mr. Thomas's view regarding the district attorney and his contention that overwhelming pressure brought to bear on the district attorney and police leadership from various quarters has thwarted the investigation and delayed justice in this case. While it is unlikely that the district attorney has been corrupted by Ramsey's defense attorneys, it is certain that the district attorney and his prosecutors have been greatly influenced by their metro area district attorney advisors and by defense attorneys' chummy persuasiveness and threats of reprisals for anyone daring to jeopardize the civil rights of their victim clients. Indeed, the district attorney and the Ramsey attorneys have simultaneously rebuked the police for, quote, focusing their investigation on the Ramseys when, in fact, police were simply following the evidence. Mm. Ooh, goddamn. He's got a few good points in there. Mm -hmm. During the course of the investigation, the district attorney has used inexplicable methods, including the recruitment of magazine writers and tabloids to leak information concerning the case and to needle witnesses quote, suspects and police detectives. He has provided evidence to Ramsey's defense attorneys at their request, but denied reasonable requests by witnesses for their own statements to police. He has thoroughly alienated police detectives and key witnesses who, whose cooperation is vital to the investigation and prosecution. His public statements regarding the investi investigation have been erratic, evasive, and misleading. They have also been profoundly damaging to the case. Understandably, public confidence in the district attorney's handling of this investigation was low even before Mr. Thomas's letter. It's coming out swinging. He's hitting hard thus far. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to skip ahead in the letter quite a bit. He gets into a lot of the uh, legal ramifications of the case and grand jury and, and stuff. But um, skipping ahead here to hit some of the bullet points. For the purpose of assisting them in the Ramsey investigation, the Boulder Police Department in July 1997 accepted the pro bono legal services of Daniel Hoffman with the firm of McKenna and Cuneo, Robert N. Miller with the firm LaBeouf, Lamb, Green, and McRae, and Richard N. Bear with the firm of Sherman and Howard. All are prominent Denver attorneys. Responding to our public information request, the Boulder City Attorney's Office supplied us with copies of the final agreement between the city and these attorneys dated July 30th, 1997, and an earlier draft of that agreement dated July 28th, 1997. In the draft, these attorneys jointly made the following disclosures to the city. Quote, as we indicated to you, our respective firms have or had certain relationships we feel obligated to disclose to you, specifically. Sherman and Howard LLC represents Lockheed Martin in various matters. Lockheed Martin currently owns Access Graphics, the company that employs the father of the deceased. In addition, in 1994, Sherman and Howard represented Access, Access Graphics in a lawsuit brought by a terminated employee. Number two, Mr. Hoffman is an outside counsel for Lockheed Martin in a number of litigations, one of which is currently pending. It is reasonable to assume that during our representation of you, Mr. Hoffman may be retained by Lockheed Martin. Additionally, Mr. Haddon represents Mr. Hoffman personally. In a case against Mr. Hoffman, his former law firm, and a number of Mr. Hoffman's former partners at the firm. Number three, Robert Miller. 
Robert Miller is currently co-counsel with Mr. Haddon on a litigation in which they obtain a significant verdict for their client and which will proceed on appeal. John Ramsey was the president and chief, chief executive officer of Access Graphics, a subsidiary of Lockheed Martin Corporation. All right, so maybe we can break there and try to sum up what you just read with these disclosures. So it sounds like these people were pretty highly attached to John Ramsey. All three of them from different areas. Right, with Lockheed with Martin. Lockheed Martin. And it's the way Fleet is, what's Fleet's alluding to here, what he's saying, it's kind of convenient that these guys just showed up offering pro bono services to the police department. Right. And all had corporate ties to his employer. Right. And didn't disclose who they worked for. That's fishy as fuck. The dis- these disclosures did not make the final agreement. So somebody asked for them to be purged right. before the final agreement was finalized. So they Which, initially disclosed it, and then it was just swept away. Meaning someone said, hey, maybe we shouldn't have this in writing, this right. Lockheed Martin connection. And then it went away. It raises an interesting point. And then F- Fleet will go on to say that, in in so many words, that the district attorney and the Boulder County Police and the Boulder County Police representatives were all kind of working together to delay a grand jury and, and the investigation. Right. This is rich people stuff, man. This is what happens when rich people get in trouble. Yeah. But look at Fleet being the fucking Batman of Boulder, Colorado. Yeah. All right, so we got a couple more paragraphs from the uh, the letter he wrote. Again, this is a nine-page letter, so we're just kind of skipping through this here. The, the entire one's available online, but it, it, there's a lot to it. He gets into some like laws that are being you know in the process of being passed then he's accusing them of delaying yeah. until those laws can get passed he has some legal stuff. help writing it for sure yeah next week's bonus show is going to be mike reading the entire letter so <laughs> stick around <laughs> yeah look forward to that the boulder county district attorney and members of his office have delayed the investigation of the death of john benet ramsey in order to take advantage of a statute which will if an indictment is not returned enable him to persuade a grand jury to issue a report telling the public that the case was delayed and that an indictment was not returned as a result of police misconduct and the non-cooperation of witnesses. It will also enable him to publicly exonerate anyone alleged to have murdered John Benet Ramsey. If he wishes such a report to be made, and of course he does since it would contain precisely what he has been saying throughout the investigation, he must first cause the grand jury not to return an indictment. This, then, is how politics would have been allowed, finally, to trump justice. Skipping ahead to the last paragraph of his letter. The people of Colorado are entitled to be frustrated and angry with those public officials and other persons who have brought this case to its current status. We must be mindful, however, of the first cause of the investigation's failure, the refusal of John and Patsy Ramsey to cooperate fully and genuinely with those officially charged with the responsibility of investigating the death of their daughter, John Bonet. Signed Fleet Russell White Jr. and Priscilla Brown White, August 17th, 1998, Boulder, Colorado. He really hammered him in the last uh, <laughs> paragraph there. We, we have a little bit more stuff to get through here, but after my personal opinion, after going through this timeline, and then finding the full train, his, his full letter and reading it, I'm like, man, this really does seem like this is. Yeah, I'm. I don't know if John Ramsey and Patsy Ramsey had anything to actually do with her murder or not, mm-hmm. but this really seems like a lot of uh, wealthy, powerful people at play here. And, and, where unfortunately, the death of John Benet Ramsey an afterthought doesn't exactly. mean as much as the companies involved. But you're also, think about, you're talking about the Whites, Fleet, and Priscilla here were the first people called when, after they called 911, the Ramseys. Right. So you're talking about their closest friends are saying this investigation is hindered because of them. Not only hindered, essentially they torpedoed the entire investigation. There's something to be said for that. Your closest friends in the world who you've now... what. What, you know, you're no longer in communication with, you broke ties with as of what, what did you say was the date Did we talk about earlier? By the time of the funeral. That's like what I read. So four days a couple later. Days. Three yeah. or four days later, the people you called first to come to your house when you you found out your daughter might have been kidnapped, you're no longer speaking with. I, 
I don't know. That's that's questionable. That to me speaks higher than a lot of these the, the quote evidence we found. Mm-hmm. There's no reason why Fleet and you know Priscilla would would go off on their own. They have nothing to gain from this. No, they're, I mean I they've mean, cooperated fully. Right. So I mean they're not out for personal gain. They're they're questioning their best friends and and essentially accusing them of just ruining the investigation. Yeah. And, and this was as far as I know his first and only public statement regarding this case. Mm. And he's not blaming them for anything or he's not accusing them. He's just saying they you ruined real- the investigation. Yeah. You're, yeah. For, I don't know. Be, There's something to be said for that. For po- the way I took it is for politics and, and business purposes is the way I take it. And it, I, I feel like that might be something we get into next week as to whether or not, even if they are innocent, did they let their politics and social status get in the way and just say, we don't care about the end of the investigation. We want to come out of this looking clean. And maybe that's something we get into next week. I don't yeah. know. I don't want to jump ahead. I mean, de- politics are definitely at play. Well, here. Sure. And everybody knows everybody and there's back channels all over the place here. Yeah. But how much of the business aspect? That's what I'm curious about now that you say that. I feel like I can confidently say that high ups at Lockheed Martin would value their own interests over John Benet Ramsey's murder. Oh, for sure. 100%. I wonder how that would look for them publicly if they just were like, we're not going to be associated with this at all. So here, we're going to send these three lawyers in to offer pro bono advice mm-hmm. to the police and uh, delay the shit out of this. It's an interesting angle. Well, and then it, it gets into then with the Ramseys. Were they just looking to protect their image and at the cost of the entire investigation? Or were they hiding something? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those. I I do think it's one of those two things. I I feel like we're far enough in this timeline that I can give my opinion on this. I fully think that they just they purposefully railroaded this investigation for what reason? For what reason? That's that's yeah, it's debated. This is not how even a well a wealthy wealthy person that could afford really good representation. This isn't how they would normally conduct themselves. No, it's not normal by any stretch. Yeah. If it was normal, they would have just sat down with the police, did their interview with their lawyer and got either cleared or the police would want to question them more. And the lawyers just say, don't answer those questions. Mm -hmm. Well, it is. And I go back to it is tough to say what is normal when your kid gets murdered. We don't know for sure. We don't know for sure how you would react. Some people might immediately go in defense mode. Some people might break down, you know. Right, but they did. They they did more. Like I'm comfortable saying they did more than I think a person would react. Like they they were overly defensive or overly Im- impeding the investigation. Again, I can't put myself in that situation for if you find your kid brutally murdered, how you're going to react. But at some point, you're going to cooperate a little bit to try to get your you're, you're going to show that you want more. You want answers. I don't think they did anything to show that they wanted answers throughout this process. Well, they did cooperate a little bit. It just took them a while. But they didn't yeah. show anything that they wanted answers. I don't think. Well, I mean, giving a handwriting sample that you're not you don't want answers. You're just you're just perfunctory going through the investigation. What does that mean? I don't think they did anything to show that they wanted a result to this investigation. Like what else do you think they could have done? Provide information that could be helpful. I mean, you're giving 160 people a list of 160 people to the cops. To me, that's saying, here's a distraction. Take it that way. You can't pinpoint that a little more. You can't go have an interview with the cops and say, well, this person looked overly friendly with our daughter or this Santa Claus or, you know, whatever it might be, or this ex, you know, I've seen rumors of ex lovers. This ex lover of mine might be out to get us. I, I just don't think they showed anything in the sense of wanting to end the investigation, they just showed more protecting themselves, understandable, but also impeding the investigation. They definitely impeded it. Wasn't that someone's theory that John's mistress killed her? Somebody said something on that. Maybe it was a social media. Yeah, or... I don't know. So that's some. Is yeah. that something we're going to get into, or not so much, or there's nothing to to support that? I, there's nothing to support that that I know of right now. I mean, maybe when I start digging into some different suspects already week. than other than the ones I already know about. But obviously. again, that's not something we're going to even give light to unless there's actual yeah something to talk about there. Cause at that point you could just say, well, anything, well, it was a pissed off neighbor because whatever, right. you know, such and such. I mean, you could probably make endless accounts like that. 
but like this this whole lawyer thing it just and this it just adds a whole different layer to the whole the issue because you have the da hiring an investigator basically saying that the police are incompetent right. and they can't steve thomas is incompetent can't mm-hmm. do this investigation properly then you have these guys come in and offer pro bono advice to help them against the da and then these guys work for Lockheed. these guys represent Lockheed martin that is really fucking suspicious yeah yep. and then like I, I mean we've said it a bunch of times and here you got a a child that was raped and murdered and not even just murdered was well, and that gets strangled lost in and had her that head bashed in. in yeah so on september 15th 1998 the grand jury began to hear evidence in the case and five days later on September 20th, Lou Smith resigned from the DA's office. His letter of resignation said, quote, John and Patsy Ramsey didn't kill their daughter and that a, quote, very dangerous killer is still out there. Okay. Take that for what you will. I I really... Lou Smith was a respected guy, right? Yeah, and I really, going into this, before I did this outline, I'm like, you know, Lou Smith seems, uh, you know, legit. And then I read Fleet White's letter and I'm like, no, I don't know what to think here. On October 13th, 1998, the grand jury began to hear forensic evidence, including analysis of handwriting, DNA, and hair and fibers found or found at the scene. On January 28th, 1999, DA Alex Hunter asked the public for help in locating a manufacturer of a toy bear in a Santa Claus suit found in John Benet's bedroom. And we will get into this bear on part four when we talk about Bill McReynolds. Ooh, that's a teaser. Mm, yep. Just bear with us, folks. Boom. <laughs> this is the first time we've talked about someone else other than the Ramses. There are other suspects, folks, and we're going to get into them next week. On May 19th, 1999, Burke Ramsey was questioned by the grand jury. And the following day, the authorities publicly announced that he is not a suspect, only being questioned as a witness. October 13th, 1999, the grand jury disbanded and DA. Alex Hunter announced, quote, we do not have sufficient evidence to warrant a filing of charges against anyone who had been investigated at this time. That grand jury lasted for a year. Yeah. Wow. Well, they, they also disbanded for a period of time, too. Like a, oh. they were on like a recess kind of thing for okay. um, a couple months, like two or three months. But still, that's a lot of evidence. 30,000 documents. Mm. You know, and I don't think I quoted him in here, but the the um, Michael Kane, the one prosecutor, he said there there is evidence in this grand jury that the public just doesn't know about and probably never will know about. Mm. So who knows what that evidence is? But yeah, the fact is is that you know we're going but, through all this thoroughly. There's shit that we don't know, and we probably never will know. But then there's stuff we're about to get to here in a second that just makes you fucking throw your hands up and be like. What does this mean? Like we need what what are you saying here? Right. So in uh in part 1, I misspoke and said that Patsy had breast cancer that went to remission. That was actually uh ovarian cancer. I got tripped up in uh things being reported multiple multiple well, look ways at you here. Correcting yourself. <laughs> no one called you out on that. It's all right. I'm owning up to your own mistake. I'm getting Thank ahead you. of the uh head of the game here. We give you honesty, folks. You hear that YouTube? <laughs> one's going out to you youtube and uh so in 2002 her ovarian cancer came back and she passed away due to her illness on june 24th 2006 july 9th 2008 da mary lacy said no one in the ramsey family is considered a suspect and formally apologized in a letter to john ramsey she said that the new dna tests have convinced her that no member of the ramsey family should remain suspects i'm guessing we don't know what those new dna uh tests not so. not thoroughly you know, of course she her her full statement was basically just an apology that they had been just canceling them out but not actually stating what they found right and just saying that the ramses had been you know treated like shit for 12 years over this and and maybe they were like dave was saying in a lot of ways we don't know what how they were treated we only know the the public image that they didn't cooperate and you, there's a lot to be said about that, but we don't know how they were treated. I would like to know more about this DNA evidence that mm-hmm. concluded that she's going to apologize to them. We'll, we'll get into it on part four, some of the evidence, what, what's available out there. And we'll, I think from our autopsy episode, we'll 
be able to clearly make the argument that none of that is accurate. Because of how the uh, the coroner decided to go about things. So many teasers yeah. for next week, man. I can't <laughs> wait. I can't wait. Let's just record it after this. Right yeah. Now. <laughs> Boom, let's go. On February 2nd, 2009, new DA, Stan Garnett, announced that the Boulder Police Department would be taking a fresh look at the case and look to re-interview witnesses. They were also helped by the FBI and the CBI. 12 years later. I read, too, that they wanted to talk to Burke again, and he was being represented by uh, the attorney Lynn Wood that did his uh, CBS Mm -hmm. lawsuit. And from Lynn Wood's statement about it was that nothing was really said other than the police came and said, here, we want to talk to you. Here's my business card if you want to talk to us. Hmm. So. So they had nothing to actually go after him hard. They just wanted to kind of talk to him. Yeah, there was really nothing to it. Maybe if he remembered anything, he wanted to add to prior statements. Right. And by this point, though, even if you did remember something and you had nothing to do with it, would you even want to talk about it anymore? Probably not. It well, ruins your life. It ruins your childhood. Unless you thought it could help find your sister's killer. If that was your mindset, yeah. I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I'd want to redig into that. It, yeah, I guess you're right. Unless you had something big. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he went under hypnosis and they pulled out some regressive memories. Wow, this isn't WWE, Dave. This isn't fake. <laughs> <laughs> on, on January 27th, 2013, the Boulder Daily Camera reported for the first time that the grand jury investigating John Bonet's death in 1998 and 1999 had secretly voted to indict both John and Patsy Ramsey on charges of child abuse resulting in death. But the then DA, Alex Hunter, refused to sign the doc- the indictment, believing he could not prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. On October 22, 2013, the unprosecuted grand jury indictments were unsealed and made public. The indictments alleged that, quote, and we're talking about John and Patsy Ramsey, did permit a child to be unreasonably placed in a situation which posed a threat of injury to the child's life or health which resulted in the death of John Benet Ramsey. The grand jury also alleged that each parent, quote, did render assistance to a person with intent to hinder, delay, and prevent the discovery, detention, apprehension, prosecution, conviction, and punishment of such person for the commission of a crime, knowing the person being assisted has committed and was suspected of the crime of murder in the first degree and child abuse resulting in death. The documents provide no further details on who that, quote, person was. The grand jury had accused the couple of committing the offenses, quote, on or between December 25th and December 26th, 1996. Well, that's a whole new angle to look at. Yep. Mm. It's a lot to dissect there. I mean, it says they knew who did it. Who did it, essentially. Mm -hmm. And placed her And allowed it to happen, right? It's saying that they allowed it to happen. And then help to cover it up. Or well, rendered I, assistance to the person that did it. And the the way I look at that when it's saying... Placed um, in a situation which posed a threat or injury to the child's life or health. So they knew ahead of time, and then they knew who did it, and then they helped impede the investigation. Is that correct? Is that the three points, like, essentially? They put her in a dangerous situation... They allowed the dangerous situation to happen, and then they impeded the investigation. Right. I mean, that's how I read this whole thing about detention, apprehension, prosecution. Like, that's accusing them of what I believe already happened here is that they just railroaded this, but they knew who did it and railroaded it to protect this person. So what does that mean? What I mean, I mean without the background information... I don't know. Does that mean they arranged this situation? That's broad language, too. It's very broad. Yeah. But does that mean they arranged it? Does that mean that Burke did it, but then they covered it up because it's their son? And they knew that Burke had prior history of abusing her or wanting to abuse her? I mean, That's I mean, the most that's, logical answer. I think based on that, that's the most logical answer. Maybe that's why people think Burke. There's no evidence to say that it's Burke. Right. But based on this, that's what it would lead you to believe. That's where your mind first goes. Right. Yeah, it has to. And, and, but that in, that's also interesting, saying the offense is committed on between December 25th and December 26th. 
December 25th would have been before any of this started, right? She went to bed two hours before December 26th. Right. So, so it's interesting just to kind of that they state that. So an, an odd couple things. I didn't include them in here, but during the um, the grand jury, there were some experts and, and people that petitioned the grand jury to be able to present evidence of um, like child trafficking and like pedophilia stuff going on. And they were blocked by the grand jury. Her autopsy, when they're talking about the the damage to her vagina, there's the one thing that uh, that they said was chronic. And what the doctor, like experts and stuff that have looked back on it, say that the chronic part of it started somewhere between the 23rd and 25th. Now they debate on mm. what the chronic is, if it was from the bedwetting and, and wiping, or some say it was... Mm -hmm. digital molestation not with a penis but with mm -hmm. a finger so there's theory there's i've seen theories kicked around out here when they're saying that they knew who did this and they allowed something to happen was that they allowed some form of molestation to happen to her and it went way wrong there's no solid evidence of that because this is like you guys said very broad language here but that's something that gets thrown around be in that, that also you could, you know, if you subscribe to that theory, potentially you could read that in that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's, I, I agree. That's, you know, you could, you this could see alludes that. to some kind of conspiracy with the family in at some level. I'm going to save this for next week. I'm not, I'm going to have to think about this. It's just very strange. It's very strange. And I think that it goes to, uh, to Fleet White's letter, I, I don't think that the DA, Alex Hunter, ever had any intentions of doing anything with this grand jury. That if they came back with an indictment, he was going to just say, uh, I can't charge it, so I'm not signing it. It was just for public uh, public image. Yeah. He's always got the built-in excuse that he doesn't think he has enough evidence. Right. Decline. Yeah. I don't know, man. It's very strange language. In, in defense of Burke, Lynn Wood came out and said that the released indictments were, quote, nonsensical, and that, quote, they reveal nothing about the evidence reviewed by the grand jury and are clearly the result of a confused and compromised process. The Ramsey family and the public are entitled to the benefit of the full, complete record, not just a historical footnote. Fairness dictates that result. Well, motherfucker, give us the full record. Let's talk about all that. Let's Let's look at it. I'd love to see all of it. I'd love to see all the evidence and be able to officially ignore all the tabloid and, and theory stuff out there. Has anyone from the grand jury ever been interviewed? There have been some. What did they have to say? In 2016, a juror who saw evidence spoke out to ABC News. They requested that their identity be withheld. They did the whole, like... Yeah. Black silhouette. Uh, I would too. Distorted voice type gimmick. Right. They said that based on the evidence they saw, there was no way that they were able to say that beyond a reasonable doubt, this specific person killed her. But what they could say in their opinion was that John and Patsy Ramsey placed her in the situation that got her killed. Mm. The fuck does that mean? You go off what the juror said that they put her in the position to allow this to happen. What's I'm that, wondering what if that there mean? was reports of abuse with Burke hitting her or just being hostile towards her, and they didn't do anything to report that or fix it. So leaving her in the same house with leaving him. her in the same house, and then they discover that oh he killed her, and then they protect him. And that could very well to not lose both of their kids. And that could be part of this evidence that we haven't seen because there is no evidence out there. There's no but solid based on evidence. That, that makes, based on that, it makes more sense than that Burke did it than anyone else based on that and based on what the grand jury might have said. And the, that all leads to Burke, in my opinion. And then that doesn't, but the, the thing is too with that is that there's no solid evidence available to the public that would make you think Burke. No. Unless you're trying to ignore things and, and push it in one direction. But mm -hmm. I think that you're going to, I don't know, I'm jumping ahead. I think you're going to think that for any 
per- person that we accuse. Yeah. You're going to ignore some evidence one way or another. Right, because at the end of the day, these jurors saw a lot of evidence that probably none of us will ever see. I'm sure. But that grand jury, those statements... Well, it means they know who did it, but there wasn't enough evidence to prove it. And based on what they're saying, though, who does that lead you to believe? It's Burke. It has to be. That's the easiest or the most. But but then that being fits said, the best. there is no evidence to prove that it was Burke. Right. There's literally no evidence that we are aware of. That we're aware of. That we are aware of. I also don't. I mean, there's there's strong people who be, believe strongly it was the mom. It was Patsy. Again, based on what? Handwriting? Jealousy? I mean, you're gonna you're gonna blame a mom based on jealousy? I don't know. Now I'm just drunk and just pontificating about nothing. But <laughs> I don't know. It just adds in a whole different layer of uh, questions. I'm excited for next week to get into the actual suspects because I want to lay it all out. Each person. Here's the pros. Here's the cons. Here's why. Here's why they didn't. And I just want to just put it all on the table and then figure out where we stand. Right. Agree. There's a lot of information over these last three weeks. Yeah. Interesting information, but I can tell you who didn't do it. Fleet White. Yeah. No. no who would have thought not. after part one when we all hated his name, he was gonna be the hero of this story, calling everyone out for their bullshit. Mm. Yeah, that that lawyer thing really threw me for a for a spin with that, man. That is uh It's just so many interesting side things like that. Yeah. But literally every every step, every scene of this crime, we have like four different pieces of evidence. Be like, oh, you want to follow this one? You want to yeah, follow that? Right. I mean, does the pineapple on the milk mean something to you? Or does that uh, industrial grade flashlight mean something to you? Does the strand of, uh, what is it, garland in her hair mean yeah. something to you? Does the fact that there's no blood in the basement mean something to you? Or the fact that her vagina was wiped clean, but it was still... Look like it was penetrated by, you know, a, a paintbrush. What were one of the windows used? Was it someone already in the house? Did she eat the pineapple at the at the uh, kitchen table? The one neighbor said he saw a kitchen light on about midnight, which would have been about when she was eating. Like there's there's a whole shit ton of little things. To me, it's not a case that you can just ignore a piece of the the the, the timeline or. Or, or the evidence like that. You mm-hmm. can't you can't say, well, the pineapple doesn't mean anything. Well, it does because they said she was asleep at 10 o'clock. So and then it was in her system allegedly at, ingested at midnight. Right, around midnight. So That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, that means someone's lying. And then does it mean, though, that she just randomly went downstairs to get some pineapple and milk, make her own snack at midnight, and it just so happened to be the night that a killer was out to get her in the house? Unlikely. Or, or was it just happened to be the night that mom or dad woke up and was like, you know what? This is the night I'm going to do it based on what? No prior evidence that they wanted her dead. And then you go off. The- I don't know. It's just, I don't, the pineapple thing is weird to me. I feel like that could have been, we'll, we'll get into it. I'm jumping ahead. Here. It might Fuck be, me. it might be complete nonsense too. Here. It might be just complete. There was a hundred people in that house. Not a hundred. There was 20 some people probably in that house the next day. Somebody could have had just a bowl of pineapple. Just some random person eating pineapple. Well, there. they could have brought pineapple. <laughs> there could have just been no, pineapple there. They could have had their own breakfast. And they, you know, whatever. And then someone goes to clean it up. They dump milk in the bowl just to clean up the dishes. and But it just gets left there. Yeah, I mean, the scene know, was chaos. There, anything could have happened. I don't put any trust in anything that was on that first floor. Because there was too many people. Plus, you got the victim. It's advocate group or whatever wiping things down. The, the the flashlight could have come from anyone, the the milk and pineapple, who knows where that came from. I mean, I understand the, the coincidence with it being in her system. I just don't know. If you believe she got up and ate pineapple at midnight, then where does your theory go from there? I'd be interested to know. Yeah. Was it Santa Claus Bill who brought her down and fed her that? Was she randomly eating it while the killer was hiding, waiting to go abduct her, and then just said, ooh, look... Perfect chance she's down here by herself. Was it a parent feeding it to her? Was it Burke who brought her down because she knows he knows she likes it? That's just if she's down there eating pineapple at midnight, where does your story go from there? That I, I don't know how you can be definitive with your answer, I guess is what I'm saying. I don't think anybody can be definitive with what, what people they say sure with seem like they are. They're wrong. <laughs> I'll confidently say that you're wrong because mm-hmm. 
My goal next week is to get you fired <laughs> up. Well, you just you can't. You 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 cannot say that you know what happened in this case. You can believe a theory, but you can't be so aggressive and say that you know a hundred percent what happened. It's just not there ac- is it's no just not evidence accurate. to support anything. It's just not accurate. So. I agree. Until next uh, week. Sorry, I'm going on my <laughs> ramp. All right. Let's get to some Patreon shout outs. We got a quite a few this past week. Yeah. Good amount. Uh, new patrons, thank you very much to Sarah Hoyt, Sydney Stein, Tyler Thorne, Renee Harbison, Jacob Creighton, Nicole Matfield, Justin Shaysby, Andrea Benet, and John Love. Thank you very much for signing up for Patreon. We are available at patreon.com slash Necronomapod if you're interested in joining. Ian, uh, what shout out you got for us? I actually have a bunch for iTunes tonight. And the one thing I didn't realize, I forgot about it until you sent me the uh, the screenshot the other day of one, is that the international ones don't pop up on our phones. We have to go into that other website right, right, right. to yeah. look at them. So I got a bunch here to catch up on some people. Um, have one for Shamrock Soldier, Jiu-Jitsu Jim, Jessica Colleen 6, Mermaid Mom 17, Chloe 46H, Necronomapod is awesome. I love those guys. Oh. <laughs> Excellent, or outstanding gals. screen name. <laughs> Somewhere on the Beach, Bear 326, Lindsay Patterson, Lacey Shepard, and my Yelp nickname. Thank you guys for the, uh, for the awesome reviews. Boom. Thank you. Dave, what do you got from the socials? From Twitter, Jen Goodrum. Sean Shank 4L and Chloe McKella from Instagram, Miss Marin and Renee Sadie. Thanks, guys. All right. We appreciate it. We are at uh, Necronomapod on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. We are at patreon.com slash Necronomapod if you wish to become a patron. And if you're interested in any of our uh, badass merchandise, we are at amazon.com slash or amazon.com search Necronomapod. We appreciate all of your guys' support, and we'll be back next week for part four. All right. You guys ready for a cool down beer? Cheers.